In our previous episodes of Designing a World, we created a basic country centered around the city run by dwarves. We mapped out the landscape surrounding this city of the Iron Coast, but our intrepid players probably won't be sticking to just this location. They yearn to explore as you yearn to create. We'll be working to expand our world tonight on Playing God. I'm Nick Logie, and with me is Xander, ooh, cinnamon rolls, Nolan. Hey, man. This stage of the bottom-up process lets us fill out our world for the players to explore. Now, your plot might not necessitate the players actually leaving the starting country or even the single city. Uh, with that, what we're going to do today, even if they don't see other places, it's important to let them think that there is an expansive world beyond their borders that they can use to write character backstories or character tie-ins. We definitely want more countries in our world, so we'll begin with that. Xander, we've already determined there's a country on the other side of the mountains uh, beyond this desert. So let's start with a question. Why does this country exist? Well, just like everything else, uh, even in our world, when there is an expansive land someone will make claim to it regardless of its uh, natural resources the things that you can get, uh, garner from it land is a place to populace a people it's a place to grow crops if you can uh, or it's simply just a place uh, where you can deal with your problems in a secluded area uh, in the united states uh, where we live there is uh, several states that are almost predominantly desert, yet there are large cities that have sprung up around, you know, wells and uh, springs and natural rivers and things like that. So a place is where people congregate because uh, obviously we can't live in the ocean. Uh, so it exists uh... simply to be held. <laughs> we can't. You and I cannot live in the ocean. We would die. Yeah, it's there a fantasy are sea world. people... This is the end. We know there are fish people, but a, a, a we played is... Bioshock. Yeah, yeah. So why does why does this specific country exist, though? What what happened to necessitate people forming this country, or not people, as the case may be? Well, uh, since we've established that it's a rather large, kind of expansive desert uh, like place, it would. Uh, it would make sense to believe that it's a little more lawless uh, and a con conglomeration of like uh, tribes uh, that may have come together with a central figurehead that has defined their borders and sort of said, this is our land, there's not much here, but this is our place, this is where we call home. Okay, so we're, gonna, we're, we're saying it's a confederacy of tribes in this case. Uh, uh, yes. Generally, they're mostly unified in what they want to happen with, like, their country as a whole and the world, but ultimately they kind of govern themselves. Mm hmm Okay. Uh, so why, why would they form this confederacy? Why would they join together at all? Who, who, who do the, these populations make? Who's making up these populations? Well, um, I think we established that it was uh, goblinoid races, like uh, goblins, orcs, and the like, because they don't necessarily have to be bad guys. Goblins don't necessarily have to be evil creatures that stalk the night to steal your cat. It can, you know, just be another people, because you're a GM, you can do what you want. Mm -hmm. It's your world, not somebody else's. Uh, so for ours, I would say it's probably a goblinoid race. Okay. Uh, so... With this goblinoid race, so we have an idea of kind of what we're getting into as we form these different tribes and figure out, like, who the key players are and everything. Um, is there a hierarchy to these goblinoid races? Are goblins uh, at the bottom? Are orcs somehow less reputable than they usually are? Or maybe hobgoblins are the primary middle ground between those? Um... Just like, uh, just like everywhere in, in, in real life, the intelligence of a, a person uh, and the intelligence of a group of people tends to stick them higher on a pecking order. Uh, sometimes it's you know raw brute strength, but if you don't have the ability to back that up with any kind of intelligence, then you're likely not going to be <coughs> – excuse me. You're not likely not going to be uh, – 
in a position of power because you can't govern people if you're not very intelligent. So uh, it would probably go uh, like the ogres on the bottom because they're not very bright, mm -hmm. but they're really strong. And so those would be like the shock troops, the big guys that they send out to, to deal with you know bigger problems or use to plow lands and things like that. Uh, then it would probably go with the smaller, weaker races like the kobolds and the goblins themselves. Uh, then up to the hobgoblins and probably the orcs because orcs can be both intelligent and strong. So they would likely be the ones that are running the show. All right, we could go with orcs on top. That and I have a soft spot for orcs. <laughs> True. Orc orcs are cool. So freaking awesome. Let, let's make this a little different from uh, the Iron Coast that we've already established. Let's not let's not even connect these two together at all yet. Let's just start with something different that is, uh, like, absolutely different between this country and the Iron Coast. What if we have the... What if, what if we have, a, like, a singular chieftain that can kind of preside over the country as a whole, even though it is made up of smaller tribes... And then, All right. like, uh, basically under that, they, we don't have a lot of hierarchy here. Basically, we got the head honcho, ba war chief, even, um, and then smaller, just chief of this tribe. And then that's pretty much it. At that point, it's up to the individual tribes to dictate what they're going to do at that point. But if we have, like, a solid, like, maybe a head orc who has may, – maybe he's the one who established this uh, – traveled the wasteland uh, after escaping from the Iron Coast and then crossed the desert after, I don't know, how about like two years, something, something arbitrary like that, and then found a nice place on, at the tail end of this desert that could be an oasis and then started setting up shop from there. All right, that sounds legit. So we've got a... I like uh, establishing sure. stories like this uh, because it helps me flesh out where the plot and not just the plot of where the players are going to see, but the 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 world plot is kind of going. Uh, because if you don't have anything like this, then yeah, you could just populate towns and cities or whatever. But if it has a story behind it that we you could create an NPC out of it, which we're not going to make a full NPC for this orc chieftain, but. Uh, you could flesh him out. Uh, he could be somebody who interacts with the players later on. Uh, or maybe there's some deep-seated hatred between the plenty uh, from the Iron Coast and, you know, the lacking resources in their country. That would, uh, that would make a lot of sense. Most of the time, wars themselves are, are, are waged over, uh, uh, over what resources are available and trying to get as much as you can to feed your people and the heck with everybody else. Since we haven't decided whether or not this nation is even hostile or whatever towards the Iron Coast, uh, we don't really have to think about that quite yet. Um, but what I always like to do is ma maybe break away from the logic, the norm, uh, what would be real. So maybe instead of invading because they need resources, maybe they don't need the resources. Maybe they're doing it out of a moral thing or simply because that's their culture and they like fighting. But we could touch on that later. Um, so let's start with a, a more generic question. Is this country isolated or is it known by the others in the world? Um, I would say because of a central location that it would likely be uh, because we have the, uh, the city of the Iron Coast and the Iron Coast and then Prairie Lands and then a mountain range. Uh, it's likely that they're probably not uh, going to be left to their own devices as people would have to cross these mountains and cross this desert in order to trade with other places that would be nice, that would be uh, nice to them effectively. So isolated, maybe, uh, but definitely known. Well, uh, all right, when I, I, I should have rephrased that. When I say known or isolated, I mean, do the other nations even know it exists versus like... We all know the U.S. exists, but this would be like if there was a country somewhere in South America that just showed up one day, and we didn't know about it until, like, 2020. But I, I, I think it should be known to the world. Like, this yeah. – everybody – people are going over the mountain for a reason, and it's probably to trade with these guys. So, yeah, I mean, it could easily be uh, described as may, maybe one of these tribes that's near nearer to the mountains is – 
really good about escorting people who have crossed the border to wherever they want to go. You got to pay them, but uh, yeah, you gotta get money. You got to pay them or whatever, but like they'll get you there and they know the the wasteland. They they've lived here their whole lives. They've navigated it. They might be completely lost once they get into your rolling plains next door, but in this setting they're uh, in this desert they're good. Very very silk roadish. Right. So, all right. So here here's something that it it gets problematic in sci-fi mostly, but let, let's talk about whether or not we want different landscapes within this country or just a single biome. The reason I bring up sci-fi is because we all know that if you go to a planet, they only have one type of terrain on it, the whole, you know, sphere. You could go to the ice world. You could go to the desert planet. Uh, you could go to the forest <laughs> world. You could go to the ocean world. But you can't go to the one that looks like Earth that has all sorts of nonsense in it. So what do we want for this? Because there's nothing wrong with just sticking to one biome if it makes it easier for you or it really uh, categorizes what you're trying to get at. But I personally like having a little bit of mixture in maybe like a prima primary biome and then with like tertiary stuff around it. What do you think? I, I think that that's, uh, that's a good call. It'd be primarily desert with uh, like large oases uh, scattered throughout. Uh, maybe a delta that uh, reaches up into... Uh, up into the ocean where it's nice and lush and green and everything and that's one of the big places much like in Egypt uh, where people tend to stick to those areas because there's fresh water okay okay yeah I'll, I'll put that in that sounds great look mostly it's desert on the west we have the oasis uh, where the in like the primary tribe started before expanding outward and then we have the northern delta that connects to the ocean that apparently is to the north uh, or maybe a C or something like that. Um, when when it comes to fantasy environments, though, I usually don't care too much about whether or not people are by like waterways. Um, I know realistically, yeah, you, uh, everybody tends to build whatever it is at that location. But in fantasy, maybe creatures, maybe a creature of one of these tribes, like some kind of race, doesn't need water at all to survive. Or m maybe there's like a a small town of... Like miners, uh, like the world's largest salt mines. Sure. And that's one of the big trade things. You know, that's how they get their money is they trade salt for food and cloth and other goods that they can't grow themselves. All right, keep that in mind for later when we t when we kind of fill out like specific terrain pieces. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and mark that down because having salt mines out there is pretty good. Uh, it would establish the trade routes between the two countries, and even if there were e even if hostilities were to break out, then maybe maybe you don't want to interact with the whole. Maybe you don't want to mess with the trade route because that would just c catastrophically destroy a lot of things. So let's let's kind of briefly touch on the history of this place. Since it is a lawless wasteland that I've been imagining basically Mad Max with orcs. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome, yes. Ma yes maybe so maybe without all the cars, but uh, no, maybe, maybe we could give them cars. If it was high fantasy, yeah, they got fucking yeah, high cars. High fantasy, totally good cars. <laughs> Magic-powered cars. Or low fantasy, how about they, instead of cars, they have like big-ass fucking Dune Runner-style lizards uh, mounted to the front of like wagons that have like sle like a sleigh Sleds. yeah like sleigh kind of um, wagon that glide across the the desert. That's awesome. So we've uh, even with that small example, we've already established that there are large lizards that are domesticated to some extent at least. Has this country primarily been that of strife and hardship? Or is it, is it a mixed bag? Or maybe it's not as bad over there as the people of the Iron Coast think. I, I love to, to create uh, things that are problems now, but weren't always. Uh, very uh, City of Atlantis style, where the city you know drops down beneath the sea and a, a large people just kind of suddenly vanished. Uh, with a desert like this, uh, I like to to add like old ruins from a time long forgotten and a people whose language you can't read. Nobody's seen them. They don't know who they are. They just have vague pictures. And it's a place where archeologists go constantly. 
And uh, so there's large cities that are just abandoned and no one knows why. Okay, that's so, actually a really good hook for the players in this case because then yeah. it gives the lore masters a opportunity to learn about something that influences the entire world. Um, it also allows the spelunkers to get in on delving into these old ruins. Like, mm -hmm. you basically just set the stage for we have dungeons out in the desert. Mm -hmm. we, we don't know what's in them yet. It doesn't matter what's in them. We can figure it out as we go along. But, yeah, yeah we've, we've established some already quick places for adventure. You could even yeah, use the, so. little, the large lizard dudes to get you to one of those old ruins. Now you got your players going from the city of the Iron Coast all the way across the mountains uh, into this desert for whatever reason. Yeah, but like the, the orcs and the goblinoid races that call this place home, they avoid these places. So they, they just don't like them. There's something weird about them. They feel strange and they just they, they'll take you to it, but they won't follow you in. No, that, sorry. I mean, that's a really easy way to introduce uh, magic into the setting as well, because we already established that it's a bit high fantasy magic, mm -hmm. um, but it's primarily on the Iron Coast side. Now, on the desert side here, if there's, like, remnants of old magical tools that are normally more advanced, then maybe they're bleeding some kind of magical radiation or something, or causing other weird things to happen uh, mm -hmm. in these ruins that kind of gave it this urban legend of... Don't go to the ruins. You're not coming back. Yeah. Oh, uh, we could also do, like, uh, the original inhabitants had gotten so uh, so advanced and so hubristic that one of the gods saw fit to strike their land and take it from its lush, green, beautiful landscapes that it once was and turn it into an ever sand and destroy the people completely. And that's, like, more history stuff, too. Hmm, that could be pretty good. Would explain why the land got cleared out, make paving the way for the orcs to arrive later. Yeah. Sure, that sounds pretty cool. We don't even need to establish who these people were or what god smote them. <laughs> yeah. Not yet, anyway. Mm -hmm. Not save yet. that for later. It's smoten. All right, so we... <laughs> smoten? Smitten? Smoten? All right, so we got... Why don't we name this this we're gonna this country, even though it is a confederacy. Let, let's name it something. Hmm. I think that uh, it should be rather orcish sounding. How about Vagosh? Vagosh? Yeah. V-A-G-O-S-H? Yeah. Like a hard consonant to start it off, or a soft consonant to start it off, and then like a, a hard combo at the end. All right. Sounds I, th very, this very is something subtle. that I pre pretty much I do, but is there any apostrophes in here? After the yes. V-A? After... After the VA. Hell yeah. All right. Excellent. VA sp apostrophe space gosh. Hell yeah. All right. So now that the gosh has been established, why don't we move into the ne the next part of kind of designing this world? Because we have the basis for this country. And if we really wanted to go and flesh it out as much uh, to the same extent as the Iron Coast, all we'd really have to do is go back through the same steps in our first couple uh, designing a world podcast and then mm -hmm. next thing you know we'll have an entire uh new country that's fully fleshed out like the iron coast i mean not fully yep. fleshed out but good enough yeah. so now we're going to kind of go to something a little more esoteric um because we're still going to be talking about people and like organizations but we're going to talk about people who can't really be drawn on a map cities can be drawn on maps like populations next to rivers and stuff can be as well but what about nomadic people in Legends of the Tear, the game that I run that you've heard a billion times already, I decided that Dragonborn, any Dragonborn, is part of some kind of nomadic people. They travel from city to city or just country, or, well, not country, dominance to dominance, uh, other, just because they don't really have a place to call home. I can't draw them on the map, but it also establishes that they could be anywhere, and just you could introduce them into the story pretty much as you see fit. So what, do, what kind of people we got out here, Xander? Well, because deserts are open and expansive, and this is obviously very quickly becoming a very important Silk Road-like tra uh, trading route uh, where people from all around have to come to this location in order to do their trade, um, there would definitely be nomadic peoples uh, that kind of want to stay away from the, the general trade stuff and just kind of live off the land. 
so I have an idea. I have a really weird high fantasy idea. Um, right. Okay, so Shoot me with it. imagine a giant scarab. Like what? All right, oh, a shit. huge scarab. It can't fly, uh, but it is it is so tall and and large that peop, the the nomadic people can move with it underneath it to protect. Like it uses its carapace as a shield from the sun and like keeps people cool underneath it it keeps them moving because they don't get to direct the beetle but uh it's it's a set piece that moves around the map and maybe the players can come up to this and say see like what is that a monster in the distance it's like no bro that's a moving town that's awesome i love it i oh god i love i love when shit like that happens like how's moving cast it's very awesome now, what kind of people would live under it, though? Would it be orcs, or could it be, like, elves? Like... I, th- you know, I honestly think that this would probably be a kind of a town of convenience. So, let's say a group of elves needed to get from one place to another. People kind of have an idea of where the scarab is going to move. They don't have direct control or, like, an exact path layout, though. But maybe you get a smattering of individuals who join up with the town, uh, help out with what's going on it, long enough to get to where they need to go, maybe one of these uh, trade towns or something, and then mm-hmm. then they leave and another group comes in. I mean, there's only a limited amount of space under the scarab. Uh, or and, and you could do other stuff with it too, like maybe uh, on its underbelly there there's like some, I don't know, hanging rafters or hammocks or something like that that allow people to actually move with it. Um, but it's not so intrusive to the creature that it even really notices that they're doing this. All right. So well, how I'm, big is I, this thing? I'm, oh, dude, I'm thinking fucking big. Like, uh, like I mean, a village you, of a hundred people could live under this thing, or like, I'm, you know, thi- I'm thinking like forty people. I'm thinking like fifty to eighty people, probably some kind of gargantuan-sized creature. All right. All right, so this thing is huge. Like, you can see this bitch off in the distance and be like, is that a mirage? No, mirages don't look that real. That's also, so basically, that's out. that could also be how the, these guys get their uh, their supplies, because if you see the giant fucking scarab, you know that there's people under it. So you could just go meet up with them. You could take one of the sleds over to, over to the scarab and then trade or leave or whatever. It keeps the it keep since the population's small and it's mobile. You don't have like a fuckload of people coming in to 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 try to irritate them basically. Because this since these nomadic people, you you've already established that they kind of shy away from the bigger places. Uh, I th- I think that could tie in well with the scarab thing. Okay, <clears throat> now is there only one of these things, or are there like multiple of them? Like well, if um, many. That, I mean, that's a good question because you could go either route, route with this. If we just go with one, then the, it could be a mysterious thing that the players need to find out about. Perhaps it isn't a biological entity at all and is a giant construct that is left over from this forgotten civilization. Mm. Um, if we have multiple scarabs, then you have uh, you kind of have the intrinsic tension that, all right, one of these things is huge. What if they get pissed off? Like, what kind of damage could that do if basically oh, yeah. a hive worth of these things, like, their nest gets kicked? <laughs> don't kick the nest. Yeah, don't kick the nest. Um, I think for uh, for the purposes of this podcast, I think we should have it just as the one thing. Okay. And that way it keeps the mystery, and I kind of like the idea that I just came up with that as an agent artifact <laughs> from the old world. <laughs> that's awesome. Like it's, like, it's like, oh, that's the giant scarab. Oh, is it alive? Well, sort of. They think it is. It looks like I one. It like, it's uh, it's got, like, a black carapace and other... I mean, otherwise it looks legit. It's just super big. But maybe if, for some reason, the players fight it, or it goes haywire, and then they... Like, after an epic fight, they down it, and then, like, the barbarian, like, tries to chop off its head. It's so big, it can't get through its neck, but it's, he slices through, lands on the ground, and instead of, like, blood and uh, other, you know, biological junk coming out of it, maybe it sparks, maybe it has mechanics in it, and then that's that tips off, like, oh, shit, there's a lot more going on here than we initially thought. Yeah. 
That's cool. And that would explain why it's been around for so long and doesn't need to reproduce or anything. Mm -hmm. Why it doesn't care that people are using it as a home because it does it actually just can't perceive them maybe. Yeah, like it just it's not doesn't programmed know. to it. Yeah. So I, I we got a we got a, a good a good yeah. solid like uh, nomadic people in here. And I kind of want to call it there with the like as actually establishing them. But you could make as many or as few as you'd like. We didn't have to put this in at all, but it's a cool idea that the players can interact with, so I think we should stick with it. Oh, yeah. um, so let, let's go with the, we have the nomads, but what are there any problems? Like maybe not people who are nomadic, but people who are raiding, people who are conquerors. I would say that uh, because this place is so intrinsic to trade throughout the world, that there are definitely people who are going to try and take what you have just purchased or the money you are going to go and purchase things with from you. And they would likely be small bands, no more than like maybe five or six, but there would probably be quite a few of these guys. Uh, so is this like bands. a, is this a group that like call, has a place they call home? Like a, I don't know, maybe some kind of army of bandits that really like spreads itself out and then at the end of their tour of evil they take what they've gotten and pull it all together into one place or is this just a uh a, a guy named genghis khan who is ro rolling through the desert with him and his posse and all he doesn't stay in one place for long he just goes to get people and like murder steal uh conquer like he maybe he takes over a town but doesn't care to stay in it maybe just raises the thing when he's done hmm uh genghis khanish maybe but we don't uh, I, was... I mean we don't have to put somebody in like this uh because no. like we're, we're mostly just asking the question on whether or not there is something somebody like this uh if there is this could be a good maybe campaign antagonist or just a major plot antagonist uh maybe it's like the act one villain of, of the game where yeah he's a threat but ultimately by the time the players reach like level five or six then it's something they can handle yeah i'm thinking more like a, a city of thieves kind of de kind of vibe you know like there's a lot of them and they all spread out to go and do their thievings uh, but if you really wanted to, you could go to this city of thieves and you could find things for dirt cheap that are really expensive. And maybe they've got to, you know, maybe they've uh, kind of dug their way into one of these old ruins, ignoring all the hullabaloo and superstition from all the locals. Like, it's just a place with a roof, you know, like keeps you out of the sun. But yeah, like that's a city true. Of thieves is really cool. And if you have a thief character or a rogue, someone's very uh, very shady, uh, <clears throat> that could give them a good place to either begin their venture or they've heard about it and they want to try and make it there so that they can see their their brother or, or whatever. Like, or even something more mundane. Options. Because because this is apparently a super black market, then maybe super black market. Like maybe one of the adventures just really like they know they need to fight some giant monster, maybe the scarab, <laughs> and they. Uh, need to go and get like a specific weapon like they know know of an enchanted weapon that the city of thieves has and so they got to make a pilgrimage there and then then you have all you could have all sorts of party conflict like all right so the fighter has to go here to, to get the the freaking pole arm of like lightning destruction and the paladins coming in is just like there's so much crime i can't not Ah, oh, I'm gonna blow up, and then like the paladin freaks out. You have inner party conflict, uh, and you could really flesh out some characters and based and their morals from how yep. the interaction goes. Um, but yeah, could the city of thieves thing could be have like a, a super complex plot, like somebody's trying to overthrow like the current thieves guild heads or single person or whatever. Yeah. Uh, or it could be as complicated as some big conspiracy to do that, or as simple as, yeah, we really just need to go here to buy something. Yeah. Or, uh, and the location itself could very well just be a, uh, like, this is where the cast outs of, of the world, the people that weren't wanted, end up. 
you know, because, you know, you, you'll, you'll have people running through the city that's going to, like, pick your pocket and stuff like that. But after they're done picking your pocket, where do they go? Yeah, like, it, it is like, a city. It, like, you yeah. can't just have a bunch of people who are constantly stealing from each other, living together. They're going to leave when they realize that they're just their shit's going to get stolen all the time. So yeah. maybe they have, like, instead of a full, like, scripture of law here – it's more like a code of ethics, like an honor among thieves thing. As yeah. long as you're in the city, don't do this. We know you want to because we want to. But yeah, we get it. We we're totally we're going to avoid that until you go beyond the gates. Now, here's a hint, guys. If you bring somebody beyond the gates, you could rob them and then run right back in. And, like, maybe, <laughs> maybe the Thieves Guild guys use that as a loophole. Because, <laughs> like, yep. you got to be shysty. A little shysty. But uh, yeah, I like like an honor amongst thieves. Like this is the the hideout for the the whole thieves guild. Like this is where they live, and they they rob caravans of rich folks, and you know try to take care of the the lesser fortunate that you know just kind of got a bad hand, and they ended up here because yeah, there's nowhere else to go. You could also use something like this as uh, I really wanted to briefly touch on the idea of monster towns, uh, oh, and like yes. a literal town of just monsters and. You, you got to get – I only wanted to briefly do this because you got to get real creative with how you're doing that um, because, you, first of all, you got to kind of be a little flexible on how the monster manual depicts whatever creature you're trying to put in here. And, like, you, you don't want to try ham-fisting too much into, like, a monster town. I tend to stay away from them, like, as a mixed bag of, you know, blended all sorts of – various creatures because that's kind of like too much input to the players because if, yeah. if, if on the street uh you have like an orc and then they turn a corner and then there's for some reason i don't know like a rust monster that's gained sentience uh that's selling um r- rusty ass blades or maybe uh somehow getting rid of the rust that'd be funny um, and then you turn the other yeah. corner, there's a fucking dragon. Like, that, that's too much to keep track of. Yeah. Maybe at the end of a campaign when you encounter something like this and you already have all the background knowledge, so you're just like, oh, hey, that guy, I, I know what he's about. Like, I know what the, I know what the orcs are about now. Um, yeah. Definitely something it, to stay away from right at the beginning of the game. It was like, uh, uh, like uh, when my character randomly and for no reason gained the ability – to uh, be able to speak to anybody regardless of their language. As long as they spoke a language, he could understand it too. It's a monk thing. Uh, the first thing he did with it was he talked to a monstrous race that would probably just kill them, but because of him talking to that monster, the monsters later on that would have normally murdered all of them just kind of left him alone. Wait, which one was this? Which creature was that that you talked to? Uh, it was the one that eats rocks. I can't remember the name of it. Oh, that. the Zorn. Yeah. yeah, the Zorn. Like, there's an entire area where people are like, you don't want to go there. There's monsters there that'll just kill you. And then <laughs> we go there and nothing happens. And we're like, maybe this is where the Zorn are from. Uh. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, like... I mean, that, like, that changed the dynamic of the Underdark because you were the interpreter for the longest time. That was a lot of fun. I really enjoyed that part. But, uh... You know, you could have a large kind of settlement of creatures that normally would not care about you. They're just trying to do their own thing. Not necessarily, you know, like a city of lawful evil and evil. And yeah. Mutually, like, when, when I say monster town, I'm talking about a mixed bag of whatever the random shit you put in there is. Yeah. And you're you're the game master for this game. You can make these creatures do whatever you want. You can make the Zorn... A lawful good race that they just eat stones because that's what they eat. And they trade primarily in, like, precious gems and things like that. They're really good at digging. You know I mean? <laughs> like, you can do whatever you want because you're playing God. Yeah, I mean, yeah, hit the buzzer. It, that's what I, That's kind of what I implemented here at the end of Legends of Latir. Like, the, the big cyberpunk cities. Like, that's when I started introducing the weird shit where you just, like, have all the nonsense walking down the side of the road. Because at that <laughs> point in time, it wasn't super weird anymore. If I had introduced that about, I don't know, ten sessions into the game, then that would have derailed everything. That would have, like, oh, yeah, brought the hard. whole campaign to a 
freaking standstill. It might have just made people not want to play because it's such an out-of-left-field thing that it might turn your players off, especially if they're looking for a more <laughs> down-to-earth, um, like maybe not realistic, but at least like more downplayed like craziness. Yeah, like, uh, but towards the end of a campaign, you can go as crazy as you're sitting in a receiving room about to talk to the president of space. Uh, <laughs> but while you're sitting there, a dragon that flies a fucking fleet of spaceship and is the captain for a nation of dragons just calls you over and asks, uh, you know, like, buys you a drink. Like, shit like that can happen. Yeah, you forgot but, to you mention that the, the dragon is Zap Brannigan. <laughs> so it's like, <laughs> I, I was like, oh god, I know who this is. I'm glad that I managed to embody <laughs> Zap and Kip perfectly so that way I didn't have to reveal who they were. You're just like, oh no. <laughs> no it's not this guy. It's like, what's the name of my ship? Like, oh god, really? Fuck. He's like, get just Zap uh, ran against a dragon! I don't want to talk to him anymore. <laughs> I didn't want to talk to him in the first place. I just bought him a drink. I know. <laughs> now, well, you keep talking to him, and one thing's going to lead to another, and you're going to be best friends. Yeah, <laughs> but because I bought him a drink, we basically got our barbarian out of fucking hot water. That actually solved a lot of your issues. I just don't want to reveal exactly to what extent that is because you're still kind of playing through it. But yeah. let's kind of move on to the the next stage of this, and that's defining like the notable terrain in the area. These are specific yeah. points that you can mark on the map, and I want and the city of thieves is a good transition into this because it's a hidden city clearly because you have clearly. a city full of thieves. So where would they hide this city in the desert? It would probably be in one of the old ruins, but because the ruins are the ruins, they're not necessarily marked on the map as points of interest because the people are like, no, mm -hmm. don't go there. If you yeah. see anything like this, avoid it. And but, like the plague. Right. This is less about marking it on the map and more about like establishing set pieces. Um, the reason why I put this in as its own stage is because when I'm doing this, then this gives me perfect opportunity to pe be like, you know, I really like this hidden waterfall that I put here that has uh, that has like a huge cave system behind it. Maybe oh, love, love those. like may maybe that cave system delves into like a connecting portal to like the hells or I don't know. Maybe it's just straight direction into the underdark if you have that in your game. Th this way you could see like. Where are your guys going to fight? What are you going to describe to the players as they enter in? Because you're going to gloss over a lot of the general travel stuff for the most part as you go, you know, day by day. But once they actually get here, like, when they arrive at the City of Thieves, what are they coming across? Like, what is the ruin like? Well, on the surface, you don't see any people. You just see an open expanse with a, a few buildings that look like looks like the, the very the very essence of time has worn them down and the winds have blown the bricks to the point where oh yeah they're you know, like uh half covered in sand like there's all the windows yeah. are blown out there's just straight up buildings that are on their sides yeah but as you walk through the middle of this town you realize that there's large amounts of like foot traffic through the sand that uh you are guessing that maybe even hours from now would be completely erased by the winds of the desert, but it happens to follow into uh, a building that's kind of small, a little squat, uh, kind of wide. Uh, and as you enter in, you see an, a being in a large set of stairs leading down into an underground complex of, you know, caves and buildings and parts of buildings that were buried at one point but have been excavated underneath the sand to kind of create this uh seedy dark city yeah you could have an entire visible to the world yeah that's really cool you could have an entire like twisting like layers of catacombs where like maybe maybe at one point if you rewound time a thousand years then the the part of the building that's underground now was above ground. Above so ground. yeah, so maybe nowadays they're just like they, they you open a door to one of these buildings that would usually lead outside if it was in the past. And then but there's just like a wall of dirt and rock in front of you and like people tunnel out like from building to building because why not use the what was left behind by these ancient people? Uh, uh, you, you don't have to build all your own crap this way. Yeah. 
And uh, using uh, things that have uh, pre-existed are one of the first things that anybody, when they come across a place that they want to lay down, their roots uh, will do. Like if there's a some land that you bought and there's a windmill on the property, but the windmill is broken. First thing you do is fix a freaking windmill and then you build your house next to the windmill, that kind of thing. Use what's already there. But, but the noise from windmills causes cancer. I don't know how we're going to deal with that. We oh, shouldn't build yeah. that next to it. I don't want to get in yeah. on politics, but I, I couldn't pass up the opportunity. <laughs> oh God. I, I thought of that the moment I came out. Of my <laughs> like, oh man, this crap causes cancer. Really people, really <laughs> okay so let's let's get back to the actual terrain so we've established the city of thieves we know what it's like now um what other and you don't even have to connect these to anything i usually don't until later uh so we have an underground uh ruined city that's being used as a city of thieves we have we could put like i, I usually have something that is both a set piece and a pivot point for the players to go to um maybe a Maybe there's a bridge somewhere in the world that is contested on both sides. Maybe this is one of the key trade route uh, locations that is like a uh, maybe a shortcut to the northern side of the desert, whereas the footpath uh, that climbs the mountain, um, that goes over the mountains but gets you to the south side. If you're willing to, you know, skirt around that, go northwards quite a ways, and then go to like this bridge across a, maybe a massive river, then on one side we have uh, a couple ogres standing at one end with like a bunch of orcs and goblins who kind of set up camp to protect that side of the bridge. But on the other side you have the dwarves and the people they hired um, and their soldiers making sure nothing that isn't supposed to cross from their side gets over there and vice versa. Yeah. Because it... Yeah, the, the, you get you get a point in which the because the players can interact with that. They could even try resolving the issue entirely if they really felt you know brave. Or maybe they can just form a small agreement between the two. It's just like, look, we've been here for ten years and nobody's ever tried anything. We should dial this back a little bit. Maybe not spend so much money on defending this bridge that hasn't been attacked ever. Yeah, another good uh, location to put that is like the the pass from through the mountains from the Iron Coast into the desert. Like this would probably be one of those contested points. It would be a location that uh, one side has one idea and the other side has another idea, and there's there's not a lot of give between the two, and both want kind of control to use it as a toll or, or whatever. Well, that's so kind of, that's pretty those. much what I was getting at there, um, because the one side, orc side, doesn't want the dwarf side getting too much in their business, and, well, obviously it works the other way too. But you could also add other big chunks of terrain, like a lone mountain that reaches beyond the clouds. Pretty standard, uh, but still fantastical and cool to climb. Since we have ruins in this world, maybe, may, maybe on the Iron Coast end of it, there is a like a giant statue dedicated to some ancient figure from the desert but nobody knows who it is or who built it or why it was built or, or maybe it's like enchanted in some way and that's why your big bad evil guy wants to i don't know seize control of it or something uh it could also be like much what you did with in our game the uh the golden tower it's just a it's effectively a landmark that anywhere in the world effectively you can just about see it and you can use that as a means by which to travel. Like in the very center of the desert, there is this tower. Once you find it, go to it and then keep your back to it. And then you will get to where you need to go. Because they're not exactly roads. Right. Yeah, landmarks are great. That wouldn't work too well in terms of the Latir uh, Eternium Spire is what I call it. Because of there was a whole the whole plot about you trying to figure out how going in a straight line wasn't getting you there. Yeah. Yeah, it, it was not getting us there. It's like, we how are we getting turned around? <laughs> we found out that, like, uh, the ability to see this thing required a magic in and of itself in order to use it as a navigator. So we're basically winding back and forth like a snake slithering through the, the desert trying to point the front of our sand ship 
Oh, well, the Shoot, that freaking landmark. Yeah, so the way it works is like even you you'd have to use magic to like truly see it because it exists in pretty much all planes simultaneously. So it kind of shifts in like its exact positioning uh, to some extent, which is really difficult to get to if you're nearby it and trying to get to it. But it. It could still be used as a reference point when you're thousands of miles away, uh, and you can still see it, and otherwise, or maybe like hundreds of miles away. Uh, but otherwise, like it, even if the position kind of changes a little bit, it doesn't affect travel because you're so far away that the reference point still works. Major landmarks in, like, say, this desert area, they're probably going to be locations of water, so like lakes and where the rivers are. Uh, and where the major cities, uh, if there are any, uh, which we have established. Uh, there, there are tribes, cities. like tribal towns uh, located yeah. around these bodies of water. Like, and basically when, when I say notable terrain, I also just mean like bodies of water. Like this doesn't even yeah. have to be significant in any way. You could just be, you could be drawing your map and just say, eh, I like, there should be a lake here. Like you don't do anything else other with, with it, but there you have a lake you maybe you go back to it later but otherwise you just kind of you you draw rivers you fill it out like you in the end you create a cool map that you could present to your players um or you could it could even ins- give you your own inspiration to come up with other stuff because if you make a lake and you just ignore it until you're halfway through the campaign but then you're looking at your map and you're like, you know what? This would be really cool if this tied into some plot that you introduced somewhere in the game. And then you name the lake, you give it significance, you maybe add some mystical junk to it, uh, maybe slap a tiny island in the center of it that has just a chapel on it, and I don't know. That, you know, the, the, the tiny island in the middle of... Uh the bay happens to be where you go to get one of your characters resurrected. You don't know. You don't know. You don't know if this is a thing that I put in Legends of the or not. You didn't play the game. You don't know. <laughs> one of the players uh, actually created the city in the area after Nick had made the map, and we suddenly had a reason to go out onto this lake to find this guy, and, you know, I... Yeah, that's a good There's point. I didn't actually, I didn't actually come up with that stupid island until somebody died. <laughs> yeah. So it could be for whatever purpose you want. Yeah, it could just be because it looks cool. I do a lot of stuff in my games just because I like the idea of it. Yeah, like the giant scarab. That's an awesome idea. So we got we got the pretty much the whole of the world that we're really interacting with done. The players probably won't see anything beyond this point, but. So we'll just stick to filling out this with the, what we can. And so basically the last part in this stage of when I design a world is putting the bad guys places. And I'm not talking about bad guys like your big bad guy, like main plot guy, or whether or not this orc chieftain that we've uh, said is part of the uh, Vagash is you know going to be a villain or not. Those guys don't matter. This is talking about the random monsters that you grab your monster manual, you decide, like, all right, I'm going to flip halfway through the book, and then you land on something, and you're like, hey, that looks cool. That would be fun to fight that. I would like to run that as well. How, where will I put this? So let's talk about where to put monsters. In the grander scheme of things, you can put a monster just about anywhere. As long as the monster fits with the place, you can stick it there, Basically, without any real problem. Or you and, could just explain uh, why it's in a weird place to begin with. Yeah. An example of, uh, you know, uh, in the middle of the desert, my character, uh, who is deathly afraid of basically anything sea creature-like, uh, Nick happens to create a an area where what land sharks attack us. Where you, where you thought you were there, safe. Thought it was safe, but... Shit keeps coming up from the fucking sand trying to kill me. Ugh. You land on a monster, you want to put this monster into a place, and you want your players to have some kind of experience in, in fighting them. But the question will always burn in your mind is, like, why did you put them there? Like, goblins typically live in caves. Uh, this lives here. These things are likely to be what you encounter. Once you've figured that out, once you've come to the conclusion 
that this monster needs to be in this place and this is why they're there. Uh, you can either make that a tie in to a larger plot points like uh, the lizard, uh, the giant lizards that the people of the desert used to scoot around. Uh, maybe those aren't the only kind of lizards that are out there. And maybe in seeing one, you're like, oh, that must be a lizard. It might be tame. And you go and approach it. You realize, oh, this thing is much bigger and it's, oh, it's trying to eat me. So uh, it could have been put there specifically for the purpose of slowing the players down. And having this particular encounter could be like, you know, you have a, a band of bandits, uh, so to speak, uh, that are attacking the player characters. And after they've that they've killed them, they find a note on them that says you need to find these people. They'll be at this location, signed number or X or or a name that doesn't quite mean anything. It gives you the opportunity to also put in small hooks yeah but random monsters random yeah encounters I, yeah when, when i'm thinking uh when i do this i think more of the just generic you're supposed to fight this you're not supposed to really or or so, somehow solve it in another way but you don't talk to it it is aggressive you roll initiative and as long as it's kind of a rational explanation since it's a fantasy world as long as it makes sense in the setting then it works uh so I want to use an example of a creature that's pretty super out of place from Legends of the Tear, and that was right at the end of the Underdark when you fought what was effectively the raid boss, uh, Ouroboros. Um, yeah, that's that, right. that was a weird creature that I put there because uh, of the following reasons. So basically half of it was a Neolithid, like the big uh, mind flare, like super monster thing that they don't like. And the other half of the creature, which uh, which extended kind of like a cat dog situation, um, was a remoraz. I think is how you pronounce it. Basically, yeah. it's like an ice fire thing, a uh, big centipede looking dude. Uh, and I just attached these creatures together as part of a magical like problem that it suffered. Usually, originally, it was two separate creatures that came together. Um, and then because both ends were constantly fighting each other and constantly trying to eat because they were mindless creatures, then basically as they ate and grew bigger and bigger and bigger, eventually they got caught in a tunnel because they were so large that they basically just couldn't pull themselves out anymore. And it was compounded by the fact that both sides were trying to escape individually, which they can't do. And since they were mindless creatures, they can't work together either. So yeah. when the players ended up going to fight them, basically one half of the party took on the Neolithid side, the other half took on the Remoraz side. And they had different terrains on each level, uh, like each side that they were fighting. Different ways to approach the problems, and, each, and since each creature was kind of its own individual thing uh, at the end of the day, then they had their own strengths and weaknesses that they had to divide up. Yeah. Even though the Remoraz was not supposed to be in that setting. The Neolithic, no. yeah, actually, because it was a mind flare colony that you were in. But yeah, there were more as way out of place. But even a, a small explanation such as that was, is enough to to make it seem real, to make it feel like, it, yeah, this is something that could happen in our fantasy world. I like putting monsters in just a variety of places to kind of change it up because yeah. you don't want to just keep fighting the same type of thing again and again and again. That might work for a video game. It doesn't work for tabletop. If you want to put some weird monster in a place, then you could do that. If you don't want to put any weird monster in a place, you could put a more traditional thing there too. Like maybe, maybe one of the ruins just does have a traditional set of goblins who are just holding up there they got treasure they got like meager scraps of food like it's a good low level encounter that's fine you could also go with a more advanced magical creature that is unable to be killed by traditional swords that stalks one of these ruins and you gotta go solve that somehow yeah you gotta go kill the thing so that you can get MacGuffin so that you can continue quest yeah, and you could you could also use this as an op uh, an opportunity to kind of create pseudo random encounters. So I tend to stay away from truly random encounters uh, because usually if there's no point to them, then it kind of just wastes time for the most part, at least mm -hmm. in my games. 
Now, if I have like my GM map, which might just be a straight copy of the players, the one that I get the players, maybe I'll mark down like a little X from where the quote unquote random encounter shows up. Uh, it might be on top of one of these set pieces that we created in the notable terrain. Yep. Because then the players approach a thing and they're just expecting a cool sightseeing kind of adventure. But maybe it turns out that there's some kind of like cliffside harpies at the uh, like on this mountain that descend when they realize that there is food to be had in the uh, yeah. terms of the players. To, to the players, that looks like a random encounter. You might even want to roll dice to see like what monster shows up or uh, how many show up, but it's not a truly random encounter because you knew something was going to happen here. You just didn't know maybe exactly what yet. Yeah. And it gives it, it gives players some good interaction. And keep in mind that uh, as a GM, you have a plethora of tools at your, uh, your disposal in which to cr- content for your players to interact with. It can be something as simple as there are monsters in this place to go fight them, it could also be there's no monsters at all. There's not a living thing that's been in here for thousands of years because there's traps everywhere. And you're walking through this abandoned place that feels so empty because nothing has been here for ever. But you see the bones of other creatures that have tried their luck and failed to get past this wall of like ancient crossbows that are attempting to skewer your players. You have traps. You have pitfalls you have uh problems like uh one of the tunnels is collapsed in and that's the only way to get in how do you get in there creating problems and encounters aren't necessarily going to have to be a monster that you have to fight Mm -hmm. it could also be anything that you want you let your imagination run wild you can come up with amazing things with basic tools I would say try so, to balance it so that way it's conducive to the party layout that you have because I do love the uh, idea of this ancient empty room oh, that yes. has all the traps. But when you're designing this, you have to make sure that it doesn't matter if the fighter or the rogue interact with trying to solve the trap. Both can do it, but they can eat, They each have to solve it differently. The rogue could probably just roll – shit, what is in 5th edition? Uh, sleight of hand? Yeah, I think it's sleight of hand. Or disable to, device from previous editions, whatever. Uh, yeah. Like the rogue can roll that to disable one, like one of these traps, but you, you can't, first you can't let the rogue just be able to solve all problems by rolling that same die uh, call every single time. And um, yeah. every, ev- everybody needs to be able to solve this through some way or another, not just through dice rolls. So if the fighter comes up with a cool idea, like you know, there's all these bones here, and it's it triggers like a motion sensor. Then I'm just gonna scoop up all these bones, huck them down the crossbow hallway, and as like the crossbows fire, then I'm gonna sprint as fast as I can as like the trap resets <laughs> to the other side. Yeah, uh, and uh, you don't necessarily have to even use mechanical things. You can also be magical traps like sigils and ciphers, and uh, it could be that the only way to get through a particular door is your locks, your rogue's lock picks, they're not going to work on this, but it's a puzzle that you got to try and figure out how to get the, the things to turn in the right way and how to gather that information. Be sure to give your players enough information to be able to figure it out, and if they start to grind their wheels uh, and kind of stay in place, not trying to say that you know any player is more or less intelligent, but you have the advantage as the GM, you know how to solve it. So when presenting your player with a puzzle like that, make sure that it's fairly easy to come to the right conclusion and or do be, not uh, all right. do not uh, penalize them for thinking around your traps. That that those that, things yeah, should that's be good. celebrated. That's a good call. You know, like if they figure out a way to get past your thing in a way that you weren't expecting, that's awesome. You want them to do that. You want them to think that they came up with this, and this was the answer. Yeah, if you're, if you're presenting you some kind of puzzle or trap that you can't just roll to disable or solve, then, yeah, you need to be really upfront about all the information that they can have. Like, you, don't, you can't just generically describe the scene and then let them try, like, fuck around and, like, try stuff and then give them more information. You have to give them the entirety of the puzzle, and then uh, yeah. you could let them do whatever they want. Now that we've expanded our perspective and filled out some major gaps, we almost have a world that is totally ready to play in. But there's still a bit more to flesh out before deploying the adventures within your sandbox. 
We've almost reached the top end of the bottom-up development, so we'll need to decide on some larger factors next time on Playing God. Later, man.